All right, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Philippians chapter 4. Now, as you're turning there, I want to tell you something really cool. Hopefully, you were here last week. I threw out a challenge at the end of the week last week. And let me tell you, it was so awesome because by about Tuesday afternoon, I think I had six different examples from you guys of doing the challenge, completing the challenge. And so I want to tell you about my favorite one. Um, And this was actually right after service, and I'm not going to name this person. I'm going to protect the innocent. And how they told me, I think they maybe embellished the story a little bit, uh, but that's okay. It makes for a greater story, and we're all about doing that here in church. I'm just kidding. Okay. But so they said they, they left here, and, and my challenge, if you weren't here, was to uh, decide to do something that honors God, that reaches out to people, that helps someone, and hopefully in that, you get to have a God conversation with them, maybe share the love of Jesus, invite them to church, something like that. And I, I gave this example of helping someone on the side of the road with a flat tire. And so I got a text message that said, hey, um, on Sunday after service, I was driving and I saw somebody uh, with a flat tire. Now, it was on a bicycle, but hey, that still counts, right? And he, he, he was like, you know, and I, I, I was like, oh, I couldn't pass them up. You just talked about that. So I stopped and I helped them change the tire. And I was like, all right, cool. You helped. And he's like, and so then I talked to him and I was like, all right, great. You know, here's the really important part. And he's like, and I told them they wouldn't have had a flat tire if they were in church. (laughs) Now, maybe I need to work on my delivery a little bit better. (laughs) No, I think they were just kidding, but that was that was so cool. Like I said, uh, I I, I believe six different examples of you guys actually taking the message. I love it when you guys interact with the message and you know, I, hey, listen, I, I, I love encouragement. I love that you say, hey, great message, that, that one touched me. You know, were you following me this week? Because you, you must know everything that's going on in my life, the way that you spoke like that. I get that all the time, but I really like to hear it when you take this message and apply it to your life and do it. That, that to me, as a pastor, that's just awesome. So, all right, here we go. Philippians chapter 4, we're going to start in verse 6. So it says, do not be anxious about anything, which is a really, really big ask. But in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends or surpasses or is greater than all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So my title for today, not so much different from last week, but it is The Path to Overcoming Anxiety, Part 5, Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life. Now, we've been saying all along something really important, something that we all have to get and buy into for this series, excuse me, this series to be important or this series really to grab hold of our hearts. And here it is, what we think and what we believe controls our worldview, outlook on life, and the actions we take. Now, we make plans, we get a college degree, we choose a certain field or path in life, we make all of these choices, and oftentimes, even though we do all of those things, our life ends up way differently than we expect. Thank you. <clears throat> it ends up a lot different than we think. I, don't, I won't ask you to raise your hand, but I would bet we could go around this room and many of us would say, where I am in life is not exactly how I had planned. But <clears throat> what we think 
what we believe, kind of that, that worldview that we keep talking about, that is really what drives us forward. Because when we get put into a position and you have to make a snap decision, guess what? You, you, you don't go through all of this logic and everything. Boom, you make a decision according to what you think and how you feel and what's in you, not necessarily according to your plans. And so if what's inside of us is not always truthful, not always accurate, not always biblical, then what comes out of us may not put us in the position of where we want to go. And we said a few weeks ago, I think, therefore I do. What you think controls what you do, or your thinking leads to action. So we're looking here at three God-honoring ways of thinking that lead to God-honoring doing. Number one, we've got to think constantly but correctly. And when we say correctly, we mean not incorrectly. We talked about that last week of kind of challenging our worldview, challenging how we see things in life and say, does that actually match up to what God's word says? So think constantly but correctly. Number two, think biblically. And number three, think actionably. Think in a way that it promotes action out of our lives. So we said, number one, think constantly but correctly. And um, I threw out this question, and I, I wanted to ask this again because, again, unless we see that there is a problem inside of us, we won't feel the need to change. Like, like change is hard, right? N not a lot of people like change in their life. But unless you see, oh my goodness, I, I just might be off. And unless we are humble enough to say that, we'll just keep on doing the same exact thing that we've always been doing. And just, what if that's off? What if that's leading us further and further away from this amazing life that God has planned for us? And no one tries to make bad, uninformed decisions but it just happens, and that's according to what you think and what you believe. And we said 70,000 thoughts per day, and half of those are conscious thoughts that you actually have to put a little bit of thought into at least, and then some of those are really big thoughts. And so I ask you again, what is your worldview? Is your worldview more like the world, or is it more like God would have us? So when we think, we have got to think correctly, not incorrectly. Think according to God's word. So then here was the challenge. Make three God-honoring decisions that are normally out of character for you. Maybe you're still working on those, and I wanted to remind all of us, hey, just, just, maybe you just got one. Maybe you got two. Maybe you just went all in. You like dove into the deep end of the pool, and you hit all three. That's awesome. But I want to encourage you, if you're still working on them, guess what? This isn't just correlated to last week's message. It's kind of what we're supposed to be doing as followers of Christ, right? I mean, we're kind of supposed to be making God-honoring decisions all the time, seeing needs from people, seeing a, a broken, dying world that needs help, and maybe they just need help changing a bicycle tire, but really what they need is the love of Jesus. And God's just creating these opportunities for us to speak into their lives. And so our thinking has to be focused on, God, what do you have for me? God, how can I honor you? And we filter everything that we do through that. And God looks at that and goes, ah, that's somebody who is trying to live according to my word and my way. That's somebody I want to bless. That's somebody that I want to move forward. So the second God-honoring way of thinking that leads to God honoring doing is that we need to think biblically. We've got to think according to God's word. Now, now again, remember, number one was not incorrectly. We've got to just kind of wipe out some of our just preconceived wrong notions, but now we've got to look at God's word and say, okay, God, what do you have for me? What am I supposed to be doing? Now, I, I do, I want, to, I want to pause just for a second. I want to acknowledge that I, I'm, I'm sure there are some of you in this room who don't buy into this church and Jesus thing, 
who are like, ah, listen, okay, maybe there's this force or this God or I don't know. Maybe just somebody did drag me here to church today. I don't really buy in, but I'm here. Listen, we are so glad you're here. That you are one of the main reasons why we open these doors. And I am not up here trying to shove anything down your throat, trying to tell you how you live. I want to give you tools and handles for the believer that we can go out and live according to the Bible or for the non-believer to say, hey, listen, just if you don't get anything else, like here's just a better way to live. And when you live like this, oh my goodness, things start changing and you might be going, wow, this, this church Jesus thing actually works. Like, that's weird. Maybe there is something to this. So that's, that's our goal. So if, if you're new here, we're so, so glad that you're here. So I, I want to change that. It could be think biblically for the believers here, and for the non-believers, it's just think positively. So I want to give you something as well. But Paul gives us this verse, and he says, hey, listen, instead of thinking about anxiety, about anxious thoughts, those thoughts that just plague our mind with just so many, you know, random terrible things that are happening in our lives and and random terrible things do happen in our lives. Paul goes, I don't want you to concentrate on those things. I want you to, uh, in fact, Paul would say, I'm going to give you some really, really good tools of things to think about. So here we go. Verse 8, he says, finally, brothers and sisters, Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, what's that next word? Think about such things. Those are the things that Paul says, I want you to think about. He he says it kind of similar in Colossians chapter 3, verse 2. This is, again, same guy Paul, he's writing another letter to another church. And he says, set your mind on things that are above, not on things of the earth. He would say, church, I want you to put your mind on things that are above, that are godly, that that, that God wants you to think about. True, noble, lovely, pure, just just all of these positive things. Don't concentrate on your anxiety. Don't, Don't worry about all that other stuff. I love you. I'm going to take care of you. So that's what Paul is trying to convey. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, he kind of sums them up in there. He says, think on these things. Now, I want to talk about that word think. It's a really interesting word. The word is logizomai, logizomai, and it means to reckon or consider. Now, we don't we use those words a lot, and I would say if you hear the word reckon, you're probably thinking of a farmer in like denim overalls, like chewing on a piece of straw, and he's like, well, I reckon, you know, like that. There's probably banjos playing in the background, right? Okay. So we don't really use that word. And, and okay, consider, but we think of that word a little bit differently. But I want to give you really what Paul meant about think about such things. What he, what the words that we would use are ponder or meditate. Ponder about such things. Like we think of ponder like just constant thinking about or meditating. Now, now the word meditate kind of got hijacked a little bit by some like Eastern spirituality kind of thing where you think of this guy and his legs are folded like a pretzel. I'm not even going to try to display that right now, right? And he's just like, hmm, like, like, like that's not what this is talking about. When he's saying meditate, he's like, I want you to focus in, to hone in on these, whatever is true and lovely and pure, those are the things I want you to think about, but not just let it be a passing thought in your mind. I want you to think about it in such a way that that is what plagues your mind. Because let's face it, when you have anxious thoughts, when you are facing anxiety, and we keep saying 3 a.m., we're just going to beat up 3 a.m. At 3 a.m., when you're sitting in bed and you cannot sleep and you are just like all of those things are going on in your mind, as much as those things plague your mind... Paul would say, that's how I want truth to plague your mind. Not that other negative stuff, but I want truth, pure things that you meditate on, that you ponder those things. Now, 
logizomai. What English word sounds like that, or what, what word do you think we get from logizomai? Logic. Logic. So Paul is saying, think about logical things, and logic is reasoning conducted or assessed according to strict principles of, here's the best word, validity. What is valid? We've got to think or reason according to what is strictly valid, because that's the dangerous part of anxiety, isn't it? When we start thinking and when our mind starts racing, most of our thoughts at that point are not valid thoughts, are they? Our mind has been hijacked by falsehood, by the enemy who is just trying to throw these nasty thoughts in there that turn us away from God and turn us focusing on ourselves. And guess what? You can't get you out of that thing. God's going, I, I want to help you. I, I'm trying to help you. Think about me. Think about these things. So not only do we need to think, not think incorrectly, but we've got to think biblically. Now, thankfully, Paul gives this, this, this perfect roadmap or a lens or to, to filter all of our thoughts through. So back to verse 8, he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true. I'm not going to beat up all of these words. I thought about it, but I really want to focus on true because I think it's, it's so important. I think kind of like some of our other lists, the, the first word here I think is kind of the big one and everything else stems from truth. What, what do we know about truth? What, what does God's word say about truth? Number one, what, what does Jesus say about truth? John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus himself is calling him truth. And he means himself, he means what he's teaching, all of that. And then it says, God, your word is truth. So not only the thoughts that we think about in our situations and we're playing things over and over and over, do we need to just concentrate on sticking on the things that are true and accurate? We need to stick on Jesus and God's word. So, so I think truth is the umbrella of everything else listed here. So finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Think about nobility, and it could just stand tall and stand firm. Whatever is right, accurate, okay? Whatever is pure, another way to say accurate or refined. Whatever is lovely, is it a positive thing about it? Uh, whatever is admirable, um, I, I thought of it admirable this way. We need to say things that, and, and I know, okay, let me, I'll paraphrase this. I know as Christians, we never, ever talk about other people, right? That's like what worldly people do. We don't ever talk about people, okay? But when I was thinking about admirable things, like, I think we only should say things that maybe we would want said about ourselves. Is that a fair way to say that? So, so when we're speaking, not only are we speaking truthful things, but speaking uplifting things, things maybe that we would uh, want said about us or thinking about those things. And then he kind of wraps it up. He goes, if anything is excellent, and, and I think when, I'm sorry, I'm an 80s and 90s kid. When I think of excellent, I think of Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. Anybody else out there with me? Okay, good. I see a few more hands. Okay. All right. So if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, worthy of praise, worthy to be celebrated, Think about such things, Paul says. I, I don't want to put words in Paul's mouth. I don't want to rewrite scripture. But if I were to take this verse and kind of put it in a way that I would say it, I would say it like this. This is the, the NTV, New Trevor version. <laughs> Find the true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and or praiseworthy things in your situation. Think about that and not about the what ifs. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about the what ifs? Remember those things? 3 a.m. You're thinking about that thing and you go, well, what if it is 
that diagnosis? What if my boss does want to fire me because he's called me into his office? What if I can't pay the bills? What if on and on and on, and that's where our mind goes? So I would say, hey, find those just awesome, excellent, praiseworthy things that are in your situation. Now, this is not easy. We're going to talk about this. You have to find some things that are true and right and noble and lovely and pure in your situation and concentrate on those things, not about the what ifs. Remember back in part two, we said that 97% of the things that we worry about either never happen or they're not nearly as bad as we think or we actually learn something positive from that. Remember we said that? 97% of the time that, we, that it, it's just not nearly as big of a deal when we're worrying as we thought it was. So instead of the what if filter, how about if we think about things that are of a biblical filter? Now, <clears throat> I get it. You're probably sitting there going, okay, Trev, that's awesome, but I I love your cute little message, and that's great, and you've got some good points and all that, but you don't know my situation, and you're right, I don't. I don't know what you're going through. I know there are some in this room right now who are experiencing way more than I've ever experienced in my life. I get it. And so here I am being all bold and pastor-like, standing up here telling you, hey, listen, you can't concentrate on those things. Just think about the happy thoughts. Just think happy. I'm like Bob Ross up here, okay? We're going to paint happy little thoughts. So I understand. This is big, but I need you to understand, I'm not making this up. This is what God's word says. And I, I always look at that through the filter of, If God's word says to do something, it must be possible. Because I'd be like you. I'd be like, you know what? There is nothing good in my situation to think about. Like my situation is crushing. I I am down. I I, I don't know how to get out. I don't know if I can make it through tomorrow. And I get that. But if scripture says to do something, there must be a way. There, There must be something good to find. Now, so what I did is I sat for about five minutes in my office this week as I was studying, and I just kind of put myself into a situation, just, just like into a, not a bad mental situation, but I was like, okay, if I was just absolutely at my wit's end, what could I find that is good? If, if I'm going to stand up here and tell you that you need to find good things in your terrible, awful situation, I better be able to find some good things in this made-up scenario. So in about five minutes, I found four huge, huge things that, hey, listen, your situation may be massive, but these things are bigger. So here we go. I'm gonna, you can write these things down. Maybe these are going to be your, your four or five things. Here we go. How about... What's excellent or praiseworthy or true? You've got a God who loves you. Yes, yes, you are in a situation. Yes, I mean, you cannot see light, but you have a God who loves you. And I, I know it's like, it, it doesn't feel like God loves me right now. It, 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 it's, I, 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 I just, it's like God's not even there. I can't even like hear him right now. I'm calling out for him. Here's what's happening, and we've talked about this before, and we've got to be so cautious that, at this. God's goodness, God's reality, God's validity, God's love does not hinge on your circumstances. And that's what we do. We look at God through the lens of our circumstances and say, if I'm going through this, then there must not be a God because if God is good, (laughs) he's not being very good to me. I'm sorry, that's a terrible way to think. God is good no matter what. If nothing else, if your life ended after this next breath, God sent his son Jesus to the cross 2,000 years ago. We're going to celebrate it in two weeks. And he hung on that cross and died for you. And if there was nothing else ever to celebrate in life, that would be enough. 
So you've got a God who loves you. That's the first one. Here's another one. God wants to walk with you through this. God, God says, I see you in your situation. And oftentimes when we fail on the first thing there and we're like, well, my situation's bad, so God must not love me. And we kind of strong arm God away. And God's going, no, 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 no. I want to walk with you through this. It sometimes carry you through like that old poem, Footprints in the Sand. We look back and there was only one set of footprints and it was actually God carrying us. I know it's just a silly poem, but God wants to walk with you through your situation. That's to be celebrated. We say this pretty much every week. God, listen, if you come in here and you believe in Jesus and you become a Christian, your problems don't just go away. That's not how life works. But you do have a God that loves you and you have a God that wants to walk with you through that situation. Here's another one, kind of, these are progressing on each other. God hates the worldly effects of sin. I like this one, because guess what? I hate the worldly effects of sin, and I put some of them on there. Disease, hardship, hurt, broken relationships, pain, you name it. Those are all effects of sin. Those things are not from God. You get that, right? Like God, in his awesomeness, created perfect. If man didn't mess it up, we would be living in perfect. That sounds pretty awesome, doesn't it? But we messed it up. Sin messed it up. And as much as I hate those things, I hate the, the, the effect of sin, God hates it even more. So I can look at that and go, Okay, God, I'm, I'm in this situation. I don't know what to do. It's painful. It, it hurts. It, it, it's, I, I don't know if I, but, but God, I know you hate this right along with me. I know you are with me. Last one here. Statistically speaking, here's another thing that we need to think about. Statistically speaking, there is only a 3% chance that it's nearly as bad as you think. That comes from that 97. I kind of threw one in here again. If you, if you don't buy into this whole God or Jesus thing, there's something that you can think about that's true. There is only a 3% chance, according to the statistics that we read a few weeks ago, that your situation is nearly as bad as you think. So I made up a situation and in about five minutes came up with four things that, man, I would just think about those things concentrate on those things. Say, God, you are good. God, you love me. God, you want to walk with me through this thing. You hate what's happening to me. You you want me to be delivered out of this. You want me to grow through this. Newsflash, sometimes God allows us to be in situations so that we learn and grow from them. Maybe sometimes we need to turn our prayers a little bit from, God, deliver me out of this to, hey, God, And if you can do it quickly, it would be awesome. Teach me what you need to teach me in this situation so I can get out of this situation. Sometimes God's just going, bro, like you're not getting it, okay? God wants us to learn in those situations. So here's some things. Here's some true, lovely, pure things that we need to think about, not the what ifs. We have to think biblically. And the third God-honoring way of thinking that leads to God-honoring doing is we need to think actionably. Think in a way that it moves us into action, like some of you already started doing last week. I, I came up with a question with this one. How can I go from biblical thinking to biblical doing? That's the question that we ought to be asking. If you're really looking to grow, if you're really looking to Take this information and say, wow, this can change my life. This can make my life better. This can help me to live in a way that glorifies and honors God. And as a believer in Jesus, that's what I want to do. I want to honor God with my life. I want to stand before him one day and him tell me, well done, good and faithful servant. i just give you a little tidbit. I don't think I'm there yet. So I want to constantly think, hey, how can I take what I'm learning, 
put it into action, put it into practice. Verse 9, Paul says, whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. So that word put or, or do, that's the action. That, that word actually means make it a routine or a habit. Again, it's another one of those words when it was translated into English. It, it doesn't really give us the full amount of what Paul was trying to say here. Put it into practice. Make it a routine. Make it something that is just a habit. That, that's, when you're pressed into a situation, boom, that good thing comes out of you. If, if you were to take this line in Greek and you were to read it just like Paul wrote it, it would say this, these things I'm commanding you to keep on practicing or doing. That's what Paul is saying. Hey, what you've seen me do, living in a way of just thinking about things that are true and noble and right and pure and all that, these things that I'm displaying for you, Paul says, keep on doing them is exactly what Paul is saying. Now, most, if not all of us, know what the biblical choices are most of the time, right? When you are put into a situation and you get a little bit of time to think about it, we usually know what the right choice is, right? Most of the time, sometimes no, but most of the time we do. Now, with that being said, I want to issue you a heartfelt but a very, very stark warning. And I wrote this down so I would say it exactly like I intend. The more you hear biblical truth like this, like I'm teaching you today, the more you hear biblical truth like this and don't allow it to change your heart and create God-honoring action, the more your heart becomes calloused and non-acceptant to change. Now, I know that is a really big, bold, pointed statement. I understand. And I say it out of love. I say it in as much grace as I can possibly muster. But I say it in a way that I want all of our hearts, my heart included, to be convicted at this. Because oftentimes we come here and we hear a message and we're like, oh, that's a great message. And then it just is in one ear and out the other and there's no doing, there's no verb, there's no application, there's no moving it into action. And scripture gives us a huge warning about this. James, the half-brother of Jesus, who um, is, is, I think, one of the coolest stories in, in scripture just about James because we don't see in scripture that James, Jesus' brother, was convinced that Jesus was the Messiah until the resurrection. Because you think about it, what would your brother have to do to convince you that he was the Messiah? Like they kind of thought he was crazy, okay? He's, he's like, I'm God, I'm the Messiah, it's me, okay? And like, like you would look at your brother and go, dude, Come on, man. I know you. I know you. So what would your brother have to do to convince you that he was actually God, the Messiah? Uh, predict his death, burial, resurrection, and then pull it off? Pretty much. Yep. So that's what Jesus did. So, so post-resurrection, James was like, he was on fire. I, I love the book of James. So he says in James chapter 1, starting in verse 22, he talks about this issue of just hearing things and not letting it affect us, not letting it move us into action. So he says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. You know what that means? He's saying, hey, listen, don't just read God's word or hear it preached or, you know, read a good book about God or, you know, come to service or hear a message. Don't just do that and then... Only listen to it. That word merely means to only to do something. Don't merely, don't just listen to it and not move into action. So it says it, you're deceiving yourself. You're thinking that it's doing something good for you just to hear it and not apply it. So then he just 
just puts an exclamation point on it right there. Do what it says. And then verses 23 and 24, I love these. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now, I wasn't at your house this morning when you got out of bed, okay, thankfully. But I know that I myself, and probably some of you here too, can roll out of bed in the morning and go look in the mirror and go, what just happened in the last several hours as I was asleep? Like, that's not what you remember from the night before, right? Like, like your breath is so bad that you can see it, okay? Anybody have that kind of breath? Don't raise your hand for that, okay? But like, like it's that bad, okay? And like your hair looks like, I mean, not mine, but uh, your hair might look like 12 birds landed in there and made a nest, right? I mean, it's going all over the place like this, right? Like, like, like you've got just dribble of, of spit that just has come out. Yes, I'm painting a picture, okay? You got to get this. Like, like you can see you got crusty going on right here, right? Because you just, like your pillow was all soaking wet. And okay, like that's what you look like in the morning. And you go, whoa. I need to do something about that. I need to fix that. And then you walk out of the bathroom, you get dressed, and you go about your day. That's exactly what James is saying here. It's saying, hey, somebody that listens to God's word but doesn't put it into practice, they're like this person who gets up in the morning and looks disheveled. I love that word. You just look a mess, but you forget about that. You forget what you even look like and you just go out. That, how terrible that would be to show up to work like, like that, okay? I don't know what that is, but whatever that is, to show up to work like that, James is saying that's what it's like to hear God's word and not put it into action. Verse 25, thankfully there's another side. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Now, question. I I love this part of this verse. How can a law give freedom? See, it says, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom. Like, we look at laws going, laws are restrictive. Laws are keeping me from having fun. Laws are keeping me from, I mean, I like to drive fast, so the law keeps me from doing the things that I want to do. But how can James claim that there's a perfect law that gives freedom? Because God wants better for you than you want for you. God loves you more than you love you. Like, I know you love you and I love me a lot, a whole lot but God loves me more, and God loves you more. And God has set up life in a way that he's like, hey, listen, I kind of gave you this roadmap. It's called Bible. You know what Bible stands for, right? B-I-B-L-E, basic instruction before leaving earth. That's not really true, but it works, okay? And God's going, hey, yes, I put some rules in there, but those rules are to protect you. Those rules are to make you live in a way that, man, life is going to be so much better. It's going to be so much easier. It's going to be so much more pleasant. It's going to be so much more blessed. That's a perfect law that gives freedom. I love that. So let's wrap this up. Verse 9. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put it into practice, and then this part that we kind of skipped over, and the, P- and the God of peace will be with you. Now, I want you to look at that. Now, think back to verse 7, or you can look in your Bible, or go ahead and you can put it up on the screen. What does verse 7 say that's close to that? Hmm? It says, the peace of God. See the similarity, but they're quite different, are they? 
Verse 9 says, and the God of peace will be with you. And verse 7 says, and the peace of God, which transcends or surpasses all understanding. What's the difference there? We have two verses, one verse apart from each other, and they're similar, but they say something very different. So having the peace of God in your life is incredible. It's, it's just saying, listen, verse 7 is like, and the peace of God, like, it's so awesome you can't even understand it. That's what will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Like, I want the peace of God in my life. And I guarantee you, whether you know it or not, you want that as well. But having the God of peace in your life that's a whole different story. I mean, like having the God of peace intimately in your life where you're actually doing life with, in close relationship with, carrying you through, the, through those hard times, having the God of peace so close to you, that's, there's nothing really better than that, is there? There's nothing else on this planet that is better than that. <clears throat> I heard uh, this past week I was watching an interview, and um, I'm not going to say the person's name because everybody would know who it was, and you would, your mind would go there, okay? But completely different context, and um, they were talking about some uh, younger college students who were just brilliant, just brilliant, rising in their fields and everything, and this person said something to the effect of, I would pay a lot of money to have your age and to have your youth, to, like to be where you are right now, I would pay a lot of money for that. And guess what? We would pay a lot of money to go back and maybe fix some things or to have youth again or to be able to um, avoid some of the things that we went through in life. So how much would you pay to have the God of peace in your life? Like, like, what is that worth to you? Now, before we answer that question, I want to give you a second, but I want to read through these. Three God-honoring ways of thinking that lead to God-honoring doing. Think constantly but correctly. Think biblically and think actionably. Now, back to our question. How much money would you pay to have the God of peace as your best friend. What would you do in life? Maybe it's not money. What would you do to have the God of peace as your best friend? If you do these three things right here, you don't have to pay a dime. It's free. We get to have the God of peace as our best friend. But he wants us to think constantly. Our minds are always racing and correctly. He wants us to think biblically, to filter every decision that we make and every thought that we have through true things in his word. And he wants us to think in a way that once we see things through God's lens, it moves us into action. We see we've got a responsibility on this earth. Isaiah 26.3 it says, you keep him in perfect peace. I love that. Not a little bit of peace, not sometimes peace, not world peace. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. That word stayed means fixated, constantly on, just, just focused. You keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. That person that thinks, hey, you know what, God, you're right. You've got a better way for me to live. And your word gives me that way to live. I want to live according to your word, God. I want to obey you in every single way that I can. That's trusting God. That's saying, hey, God, you can, you, you can have my life. I'm done trying. I've done messed it up. But God, it's, it's yours. I want to give it to you. That's trust in God. And Isaiah says, 
the person that does that will be in perfect peace. Because you know why? Because he's going to be absolutely focused on God. So it starts with hearing and understanding. That's the thinking part, right? That Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. Like he is it. There is nothing better to live for. It is all about him. That's the hearing and understanding. And then it moves to the believing or accepting that he can and should be the Lord, the master in charge of your life. And when we finally learn to put God in that position, God, this is no longer about me. God, I'm tired of driving this ship. I I give it to you. That's when we will experience perfect peace. That's when we will experience the God of peace directly in our lives. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are good. God, thank you that in our sin, in our shame, in our turning away from you, you're still pursuing us, that you still desire relationship with us. God, thank you that you don't want us to worry. You don't, you don't want us to live lives of anxiety. You don't want us to live lives of just focusing on other things. But that you have said so clearly over and over and over in your word to keep our eyes focused on you. Help us to do that, God. God, you promise us that you will give us perfect peace. No more what ifs, Lord. God, help us to think in a way, not just in our bad situations, not just in the things that are happening to us, but God, help us to think in all areas of life, biblically, God honoring ways to think. And God, I just pray that you would help us to move those thoughts into action. God, you have called us to a greater purpose. God, this world is lacking purpose. But you have given it to us. So God, help us to search out that purpose of living for you, giving our lives to you, furthering your kingdom on this earth. Thank you, God, that you love us. No matter what, God, that you will carry us through. So help us, God, in our storms, in our trauma, in all of our junk to not run from you, but to run to you. And God, help us to run towards a broken and dying world who needs the love of Jesus. If you're here this morning you have never experienced the love of Jesus I want to give you an opportunity to do that heads are bowed, eyes are closed if that's you, if you say, you know what I don't have a relationship with Jesus I want Jesus what you're talking about Trevor it it just, it sounds too good to be true and I, I, I want to try it it's very simple Would you just say, Jesus, I give you my life. I trust that you died and hung on a cross for me. But better than that, you rose again. So God, take my sin. Take my shame. I give it to you. God, save me change me, transform me in a way that lives for you. And God, I give you my life. I trust in Jesus as my Savior. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you, if you said that today for the first time, you would 
desire to start a relationship with Jesus, would you just slip your hand up? I'm not going to call you out, but I just want to know to pray for you. To say, I got it right for the first time today. God, thank you that you are good. Thank you that you are kind. And thank you that you love us. Thank you that we can call you a savior. God, help us to see you for who you truly are. A God of peace, not a God of wrath, but a God of peace, a God of love, a God of forgiveness, a God of grace, a God that cannot be outdone by our junk and our sin and our shame. God, we pray for this time of offering. God, help us to be a generous church. Help us to reach out into this community and do things like never before. God, through our giving and our generosity, God, I pray that your kingdom is furthered and people come to know you. Thank you, God, that you are good and that you are generous to us. We love you, Lord. We praise you. And it is in the awesome, most holy name, the name of Jesus, that we pray. Mm -hmm.